Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Good afternoon to you all. My name is Bill West. And my name is Samuel Smith. Well, first, let me um, start by saying uh, thank you to all of you for attending this webinar. We really enjoy hosting these events. We appreciate you giving us your time today to learn more about the many roles and duties and the great importance of the data bank administrator. All of the content today, by the way, came from questions, phone calls, and feedback that we received from all of you. As for me, I work in NPDB's compliance branch. We work closely with many different customers on a variety of compliance-related issues and activities. And I work in our customer service center, spending my days helping customers with questions, covering every corner of the NPDB. Next slide. Sam, by the way, it's good to see you. Likewise, Bill. <laughs> well, before we get into the content here, I'd like to go over some housekeeping issues for you. If you don't have a copy of the slide deck to follow along, you can download it now using the link in the chat pod. We'll leave the chat open throughout the presentation for all of you to use. And we've prepared some quizzes for you to keep you on your toes as we move through the slides. When you're answering the quiz questions, you can just type your answers into the chat to share with everyone. It's very um, casual. We're not grading you or keeping track of your answers. If you have a specific question, though, you'd like to ask us as we move through the slides, you can type your questions into the Q&A pod. If you add your email address to your question, we can be sure and get back to you if we don't have a chance to get to your question during our presentation today. If you're a member of NAMS, attending attendees of today's live webinar qualify to receive one NAMS approved continuing education credit. NAMS certificates will be sent out one to two weeks after the webinar. Also following today's slides, we'll answer some of the many, many questions you have already, we have already received from you. And we'll also try to answer additional questions that you submit in the chat today. Once again, don't worry if we don't get to your specific question today. Add your email address when you submit your question and we'll make sure to get back in touch with you. We're also gonna post a Q&A document on our website in a couple of weeks to capture all the questions that were asked. And we'll email that link to you so you have that additional resource. Next slide. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. First, we'll give you a quick overview of the data bank administrator's role. Then we'll actually take you into our system, Sam will take you into our system, to give you an overview of the user account screens that we'll be discussing in some detail today. Then Sam and I will spend most of our time discussing specific aspects of account administration, including walking you through how to create and delete user accounts, how to become the new administrator and add administrator accounts. We'll talk about passwords and what to do if you ever need to reset your password or recover user credentials. Then we'll cover how your NPDB user credentials tie into many of your credentialing systems. Along the way, we'll walk through the areas that you ask us the most questions about and explain how to complete various tasks. So hopefully you'll have an easier time when you log in and use our system. Finally, we'll review popular questions you asked when you registered for this session, and then we'll open it up and answer questions that you're typing into the, uh, the Q&A pod now and during the session. We should take a little under an hour to go through the material, and when we finish up, Sam and I will stay around and answer additional questions if you'd like to stay online with us. Next slide. Okay, so let's get started. First, a general overview. And then we'll discuss two important account roles that every organization has to decide about and exactly what they both mean. Sam? This pie chart shows a breakdown of the cases you contact us about. As you can see, when it comes to account administration, the majority of these cases are about accounts being locked and passwords needing to be reset. We help with non-password related cases, such as when you've forgotten your user ID or your data bank ID number, or what we call your DBID, or yes, that real long number. We also help you with other user account cases where we can walk you through creating accounts, deleting accounts, or when you need to update your user profile. 
Each year, we receive thousands of calls about password and user account management related issues. We will be speaking to many of those issues in our session today. Next slide. Well, when you register with the NPDB right away, you fill in names for two important roles, the certifying official and data bank administrator. So what exactly is the certifying official? The certifying official is the person at your organization that can vouch for the legitimacy of your registration with us. That means they accurately select and sign off on the registration type that fits your particular organization. They're also responsible for notifying us of any change in your organization that might affect your eligibility to use the NPDB. Or if your organization stops using the NPDB for some reason, in these cases, the certifying official must notify the NPDB to deactivate your registration. Note that it is the data bank administrator account that's created when you first register your organization. There won't automatically be a certifying official user account that's created. If the certifying official also needs a user account, the data bank administrator will need to set that user account up. And yes, yes, the certifying official and the data bank administrator can be the same person. So Sam, a question that comes up here, who do organizations usually choose as their certifying official? Well, Bill, we, we typically see executives, CEOs, vice presidents, hospital administrators, or human resource directors as titles for the certifying official. If the certifying official and the data bank administrator are the same person, we've seen credentialing or staff managers, for example, and for organizations that are agents, we've seen product owners or program managers. It is the organization's decision whom to designate, but remember, the certifying official is the person empowered to certify the legitimacy of the organization to participate with the MPTB. Next, Next slide. The data bank administrator is the second important role that you need to decide when registering with the MPDB. The data bank administrator manages NPDB activities and is responsible for tasks such as renewing the NPDB registration, attesting to the organization's compliance with NPDB reporting, querying and confidentiality requirements, maintaining important billing and credit card payment information for queries, adding authorized agent relationships, keeping important information such as the registration profile up to date, and if you're a data bank administrator for a state board, the regulated professions, current and creating and maintaining NPDB user accounts, including creating any backup data bank administrators. Next slide. The administrator role is one of four roles that can be added to a user account. In addition to the administrator role, the other roles are query, that allows a user account to query the MPDB, report that allows user account to report to the MPDB, and billing lookup that allows a user account to search and view billing transactions. Next slide. Great, now let's have Sam actually log us into the system and show you more about the account administrator areas we'll be discussing with you today. Sam, can you log us in? Sure thing. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Bear with us as we transition to that. Great. So Thanks. right now I'm at the sign in page of the MPDB. I'm going to sign in with the data bank ID number and a user ID. and click on sign in. Once I'm signed in, I'm taken to the entity registration confirmation screen. I'm able to see who I'm signed in as. I'm also able to see any new NPDB correspondence. So for example, this is a correspondence that tells me that an entity agent relationship has been approved. I'm also able to see the last sign in for this particular user account and also our next registration renewal date. Once I'm ready to move proceed, I click on continue. You'll see on the select an option page 
uh, different options depending on what role you have. So again, if you're able to query, you'll see the query feature. If you're able to report and have the report role, you'll see that. Uh, if you're the administrator, you'll see uh, the administrator options. And if you have the billing lookup role, you'll see the view billing history. So this account has all of the roles. So let's go ahead and take a look at the administrator options page. Under the administrator options, there are many functions that can that an administrator can configure for the organization. We'll talk about maintain user accounts in a second, but let's talk about the update registration profile. So here you're taken to the review summary screen where you're able to review the organization's registration information. If you ever need to update any information, you can come to this screen. For example, if you need to update the certifying official, you can click on edit. And then you'll be taken into the flow workflow where you can update the certifying official. You can click on the checkbox if you need to change the certifying official. If you already have an administrator that has an account, you can make a, the certifying official, a, the administrator be the same person. Or you can certainly add a new person if you need to do so. Keep in mind, if you add a new person and they do not have a, a, an account, you will need to go through the identity proofing process. And we will talk about that a little later. Going back to the administrative options, we also have maintain IKRS credit cards where you can add a store or store a saved credit card. You would just add your credit card information if you're paying queries via credit card. You can add agent relationships. So if you have an agent, you can add that agent relationship here as well by clicking on add an agent and filling out that information. You also can enter your EFT or electronic funds transfer if you're paying queries through EFT. And you can purchase query credits as well. If you're using a credentialing system, you can configure access to your credit to that software uh, here uh, with creating connections through the QR access configuration screen. We have entity notification preferences. If you need to deactivate continuous query because it is uh, set on as default, you can do so here. Also for continuous query options, if you wanted to set, this is for the entity, if you wanted to set uh, the enrollments to be automatic every month, this is where you do that for the entity. And if you just want to show just continuous queries, so for example, if your organization just runs continuous queries, you can set it such that you are only able to run continuous queries, or you can set it such that you can be able to run both continuous and one time. We have the entity notification preferences as mentioned, and also the last is the administrative training. And the administrative training, as we are discussing in this session, uh, gives you a self-guided training course to familiarize yourself with the tasks of being the administrator. And you must click complete this formal administrative training in order to create user accounts. The maintain user accounts screen takes you to the maintain user accounts page where you can see all of your different user accounts uh, and their status. You can see if they're locked or pending or active, and you can uh, delete uh, accounts or create accounts from this particular screen. And again, we'll be discussing a lot of this today. So let's go ahead and go back to our slide presentation. Excellent. To fully complete the administrative training, you will need to acknowledge and agree to accept responsibility for creating user accounts. You must treat the information you receive from users as confidential and maintain it in a secure manner. In addition, upon first sign-in, in order to access the NPDB, each user will need to agree to the rules of behavior and subscriber agreement which talks about not sharing accounts and securing your password. Next slide. So here are your first takeaways. 
It's strongly rep recommended to designate more than one account with the administrator role and thus have more than one da data bank administrator. Many of the administrative functions reside on the administrator options page. And the formal administrator training module must, much of the content we're discussing must be completed and the agreement ag agreed to before you're able to create user accounts. Next slide. Well, Sam, it looks like it's time for our first quiz. True or false, the certifying official and the administrator are two distinct roles and therefore must be two distinct individuals. True or false? Please take a minute to type your answers into the chat pod. Well, Sam, what's the verdict? Well, Bill, I'm seeing a lot of false in the chat and the answer is false. The certifying official and the administrator can be the same person, but they do not have to be. Sam, one other, one other question that comes up a lot, who from the organization can actually serve as the data bank administrator? That's a great question, Bill. The data bank administrator can be anyone at the organization who interacts with the NPDB. It does not have to be a director or someone at the executive level. And, the same individual can be data bank administrator for more than one entity. A question we receive a lot at the customer service center is if a person, for example, from the internal credentialing verification office of a hospital system can serve as data bank administrator for the multiple hospitals within that system. The role of the data bank administrator should not be outsourced to a consultant or someone from a software credentialing company, for example. They can be the administrator of their own agent organization. But if the individual from the CBO is an employee of the hospital system, then yes, they can serve as the data bank administrator. Next slide. Great. Well, now let's switch gears and talk about the user account creation process. We get a lot of questions about that. We mentioned earlier that each user must have their own individual user account, and there are three steps to creating a user account. First, you create the user account request, then you identity proof the user, and lastly, you approve the user account. Sam's going to walk us through the process. Next slide. When the formal administrator training module is complete, you're now able to access the user account request form where you will start the account creation process. You'll create a user ID for your user, enter their email address, and select the roles that you want to give that user. Let's talk about user IDs. Next slide. Bill? There are some requirements for user IDs. They have to have these qualities, at least eight characters, letters and numbers only, no symbols, and they are case sensitive, so lower and uppercase letters matter and IDs should be unique to the individual. So no shared user IDs. Bill, what about spaces? Can a user ID have spaces in it? No, sir. Uh, spaces are not allowed in user IDs, letters and numbers only, no spaces. Next slide. Once the administrator creates the user account, the user will receive an email with instructions for registering. The email link is time sensitive and expires after five calendar days. Next slide. The user clicks the link within the email and is taken to the NPDB account. They will enter their user information, create a password, optionally enter their mobile number to use the one-time password feature, set challenge questions, and select notification preferences. Next slide. Okay, so the second part in creating the user account is identity proofing. Identity proofing is a major NPDB security component. So account users must have their identities proofed or authenticated as part of your registration renewal and user account creation. Once the user completes the user account request, they can download the user registration documents on the very next screen. Users are instructed to download and print their registration document and complete the identity proofing by using one of two methods. You can be proofed by your data bank administrator or by a notary republic. Next slide. 
This is the user registration document you would fill out if your data bank administrator will be identity proofing you. A user has to provide either a work badge with photo ID that contains a unique serial number or a government issued photo ID like your driver's license. And we've highlighted here the areas that um, you have to fill in. Next slide. This form looks similar, but in this case, this is the form for the notary public option. When users meet with the notary public, you have to present a government issued photo ID like a driver's license, sign the document witnessed by the notary, and then at the bottom part of this form, the notary signs and fills in their information, and then you're done. Next slide. This slide shows the notification your account administrator receives when a new user downloads either of the registration documents that we just looked at. Next slide. When the user is identity proofed, the third and final step is for the administrator to sign back into their account and approve the pending user account. Click on approve the account in the NPDB correspondence to go to the account approval page. Next slide. Select approve or reject if for some reason you need to reject the account. Then enter your information as the authorized submitter and submit the form to the NPDB. When you approve as the administrator, you're certifying that the individual's information is accurate. The individual is affiliated with your organization and that you've witnessed the individual's signature on the NPDB user registration document. The user registration document should be kept with the organization and does not need to be sent to the NPDB. Next slide. Once approved, the user account is activated. Next slide. So in summary, creating a user account is again, a three-step process for the administrator. You create the new user account request, you identity proof the new user, and then you approve the user account. Okay, get your keyboards ready. It's time for our next quiz. True or false. Once the administrator completes and submits the online form after clicking the create account button, the user account creation process is complete. Let's see your best guess in the chat. What's the answer, Sam? Bill, the answer is false. The administrator must do three things when creating an account. Number one, create the account request. Number two, identity proof the user. And number three, approve the account. We wanted to emphasize this point, especially because many times the call center receives calls where administrators have left the organization, but did not fully complete the account creation process, particularly the final step of approving the account. If the appro account approval does not take place, then the new administrator will essentially have to start the process over from the beginning, which includes completing a registration for the organization and creating a new administrator account at that time. So you definitely want to make sure the administrator fully completes the user account creation process. Next slide. Well, now that the accounts have been created and approved, let's see what options users and administrators actually have. Next slide. Well, every user and administrator has the option to update their own account profile. You can do that by selecting the update user account link located under the maintenance section on the options page. Next slide. On the user account information screen, you will find your user account information, including name, email and business addresses, change password, and recovery options, including resetting your challenge questions. Next slide. All users can set their notification preferences. The NPDB can notify users of report disclosures, query responses, and users can view the latest issue of the NPDB Insights newsletter. For accounts with the administrator role, 
the administrative events notification preference is automatically selected by default and must remain. They are events such as when it's time to renew your NPDB registration, the successful processing of your organization's registration, and activation, deactivation, or update of an organization entity relationship, excuse me, organization agent relationship. Next slide. Users can also customize their own query response preference, indicating if they would like their query responses bundled into one or multiple files. Next slide. NPDB administrators can manage their user accounts using the Maintain User Account page. This page shows you all of your user accounts within your organization. If you have a large set of user accounts, you can use the column headings to sort the list alphabetically, and you can use the bottom filtering options to filter by status or role. Next slide. Sam, earlier you mentioned that the link in the email to create an account can expire. So if that happens, what can be done about that? Yes, the user account request link that the user receives through email is good for five calendar days. The user account would then show on the maintain user account screen as pending. As many times as necessary within that five days, the account administrator can resend that request to the user by clicking on the pending user account ID and then clicking on this resend email button. After five days, the request will expire and data bank administrators would need to delete the pending user account and recreate the account request. Next slide. Data bank administrators can modify user accounts by assigning and unassigning users to specific credit cards for query payments, add or remove user roles, including adding the administrator role to a user account, resetting a user's password, and deleting the user account. Next slide. The most common reason why you would need to delete a user account is that a user has left your organization and the account is no longer needed. Immediately delete a user account once the user leaves your organization to maintain entity security. Select the reason for deletion and submit to NPDB. Next slide. Here are the key takeaways from account administration. First, data bank administrators have many of the tools needed for account administration. They can create, delete, and update user account roles, and importantly, they can reset user passwords. If needed, they can resend the new user account request, and all account users can manage and update their individual account profile. They can set their password, set account recovery options, including challenge questions, and set their own individual notification and query preferences. Okay, now let's test your knowledge. Next slide. True or false, users should contact an NPDB administrator within the organization if they need to recover their user ID or have their password reset. What is your answer, true or false? Is that true, Sam? Well, Bill, it is true. The NPDB administrator has many of the tools needed for account administration. And data bank administrators are responsible for managing their organization accounts. The customer service center assists data bank administrators with their password and refer account users back to the data bank administrator for any other account administration need. Next slide. So we realize that many of you in attendance today are already the account of the data bank administrator. Still, we receive lots of questions about the four different ways of becoming a new data bank administrator. It's good to know in case you switch to a new or a different registered entity, or you become the data bank administrator for multiple entities, such as in a CVO or a health system. So let's see how that's done. Sam? 
Becoming a new administrator depends on the state of your current administrator, if they are with or no longer with the organization, and the status of your user account, if you currently have one or do not. We covered the first two scenarios and have shown you how the administrator role can be added to an active user account if the current administrator is still with the organization. Or scenario number two, how the current administrator can create a new account, adding the administrator role if you have no account. Let's briefly discuss the other two scenarios. Scenario three is for those who currently have an active account without the administrator role and need to become the new administrator for the organization, but have no current administrator to add the role to their account. If you're in this category, contact the customer service center. We will send you a form to complete in order to add the administrator role to your existing account. The last scenario of becoming a new administrator is when there is no active or available administrator. For example, the previous administrator is no longer with your organization or the current administrator is on extended leave and unavailable. If you do not have a user account belonging to that entity, you will essentially be starting the new administrator process over from the beginning, completing a registration for the entity, which includes creating a new administrator account at that time. So Sam, a question for you about that. You said that they will have to complete a registration for their organization. How, how does that work? Won't they end up with um, a, bunch of, a bunch of registrations? Well, Bill, that's an excellent question. Yes, the new administrator process may feel like deja vu, but it is a way for us to ensure that we only give access to the appropriate individuals. Once the new administrator completes the registration, they will receive another DBID, what I call a temporary DBID. They will use this temporary DBID to sign into NPDB and upload the registration paperwork and any supporting registration documentation. Once the NPDB successfully processes the registration, the created administrator account will transfer to the already existing registration. The new administrator will then be approved to sign into the NPDB, and they will retrieve the already existing Data Bank ID number at that time, if they don't already have it. So there still will be only one active registration for the organization. Next slide. That makes sense. Well, here are some key takeaways for becoming the new Data Bank administrator. We recommend you have multiple users with the administrator role for backup. It is much easier to become a new administrator when the current administrator is still with your organization. If you are departing from your organization, ensure that a new data bank administrator is designated before you leave. Remember that for the security of your account and the security of our data, our customer service team only resets passwords for data bank administrators. And now it's already time for our next quiz. True or false, one way to become a new administrator when the current administrator is leaving the position is to sign into the user profile of that account and update the information with the new administrator's information. True or false? What do you think, Sam? Well, Bill, this is false. Accessing the user account of another individual is a violation of federal law. Uh-oh. New user accounts should be created, not shared. Changing the current administrator's profile with the new administrator's information will immediately lock the account. If there are no other data bank administrators, the new administrator would then have to go through scenario number four as having no user account, which means starting the new administrator process from the beginning, completing a registration for the entity and creating a new administrator account. Next slide. All right, let's move on now to passwords. Passwords affect all administrator and non-administrator accounts. Let's talk about methods that everyone can use to recover and reset their account credentials. Next slide. 
Clicking the Need Help to Sign In link on the Sign In page will take you to the User Account Help page. User Account Help is the area that allows you to reset your password or recover the other two credentials, your user ID or the DBID. Let's walk you through the reset password process. To reset your password, enter your DBID and your user ID. Next slide. Once you enter your DBID and user ID, you're prompted to answer one of your five preset challenge questions. Next slide. Once currently answered, you are then prompted to create your new password according to the listed password guidelines. Next slide. Once you have created a password, you will be prompted to check your email, which will have a link that you must click on to activate the new password. Next slide. Use the link to complete your password reset process. Note that the, the link is time sensitive. It can only be used once and must be used within one hour. Next slide. Thanks, Sam. A note on the password guidelines. Sometimes people forget that the NPDB is part of the federal government, and as a government system, we have strict password guidelines. The security of the data you submit to us and the data we share with you is a number one priority for us. Our password requirements follow standards created by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, and at times these standards are updated and changed. Currently, you create a 15 character minimum password or passphrase. It could be something as simple as, I close the laptop or I really love the NPDB. Passwords don't need to include an uppercase letter or a special character or a number. If you want to include them to make a stronger password, that's also fine. Passwords do have to be changed every 55 days and we'll remember you, we'll, we'll remind you the week before by email. Next slide. Here's how to recover your user ID or DBID. You will need to know two out of the three required credentials to recover the third one, one of them being your password. So if you're trying to recover your user ID, you will need to know your DBID and password. If you're trying to recover your DBID, you'll need to know your user ID and password. From the sign in page, click on need help to sign in. And on the next screen, you will enter the requested information and answer your challenge questions. You'll then receive an email with a link to sign into your account. Sign in with your DBID or user ID and password, and you'll see the recovered credential on the screen. Next slide. Instead of memorizing a 15 character system password that must be changed every 55 days, if you entered your mobile phone number into your user account profile in advance, you have the option to request a one-time password sent via text message to your mobile phone. This one-time password is only effective for five minutes, so to be short, so be sure to sign into your account promptly. The one-time password received by text does not take the place of your system password. However, you can continue to use the one-time password feature every time you want to log in, even after the system password expires. Just send yourself a one-time password. On the sign-in page, enter your DBID and user ID. Click the Send Me a Password button, and you will receive a password via text message. Enter the password to sign into your account. Next slide. That sounds like the way to go, Sam. In summary, use account help to help recover your account credentials and reset your password. If you're a user having trouble, get in touch with your NPDB administrator. If you're an NPDB administrator having trouble, please contact our customer service center. Remember, passwords expire every 50, 55 days, but you won't receive a password expiration reminder if your mobile number is on your account. 
It's also important that you consistently use only one sign-in method, either your system password or the texted phone password. If you opt for the phone password, you don't have to remember the other one. Okay, it's time for quiz number five. Here's the next question, Sam. True or false? I will need to know two out of the three account credentials, DBID, user ID, password, in order to recover the third credential. Let us know, true or false? What do you think, well, Sam? Well, I think that is true. You will need to know your, your password in order to recover your DBID. or your user ID. And We're going to briefly touch on using your NPD in-house credentialing system. Take it away, Sam. If you are using credentialing software, the software uses NPDB user account credentials, DBID. Note that the NPDB credentials are likely different credentials used to sign into your credentialing software. The correct NPDB credentials must be used in order to successfully submit transactions between the two systems. If you've recently changed your NPDB password, you must also update that NPDB password in your credentialing software. Otherwise, invalid login attempts will be created and your account will lock. Once that happens, you will need to reset your password and ensure that password is updated in your software system. If you are using the one-time password sent to your mobile phone, that password should not be used as the password set in your credentialing system. It should be the system password for that user account, which will need to be changed every 55 days and again, set in your software. Next slide. So the key takeaways are that you must be using the correct NPDB credentials to send and receive transactions from your software and NPDB. Otherwise, the NPDB user account will lock. Although some systems can reset your NPDB password from within the software system itself, you can always come to NPDB, reset your NPDB system password, and then set that new password within your software system. Check with your software vendor on how to properly change the password as software platforms are configured differently. Bill, take it away for our final quiz. Okay, true or false. Using the mobile phone sign-in method is not recommended, not recommended if your account credentials are also being used with your credentialing software. True or false? Sam, what's the answer? I'm seeing a lot of trues in the chat, Bill, and it is true. Sticking to one sign-in method really helps users sign in successfully on a consistent basis. Many users who use, whose NPDB credentials are connected to their credentialing software find that it's just easier to consistently use a system password for NPDB sign-in, as opposed to the one-time password, since the one-time password should not be used as a password set in your credentialing software anyway. Well, Bill, it looks like that almost wraps up our slides for today. I wondered if anyone scored 100% on all the quizzes. We're going to have to see. Next I know slide. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right, next slide. Well, Sam, we really did cover a lot of territory this hour. We looked at uh, administrators and certifying officials, identity proofing. We looked at using notaries. We looked at account creation and deletion for new administrators and users. Um, we looked at account administration and ways to become the new administrator. And some are more challenging. 
And then we looked at passwords and self-service, self-help, and using one-time passwords. And then finally, using NPDB account credentials with credentialing software. Next slide, please. Well, this slide links to some additional resources for you to take a look at um, when you have time. Next slide. We'll also be sending a survey around to you so you can provide us with feedback about today's section. Next slide. And here's where you can go if you wanna learn more about our parent agency, HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration. You can get more detail on HRSA's programming, programming at www.hrsa.gov. That's not to be confused with the NPDB website. Uh, all, of, all of the information we referenced today can be found at npdb.hrsa.gov. When you browse our website, if you don't already receive our monthly newsletter, you can sign up for NPDB Insights at the very bottom of our homepage. Next slide. Well, Sam, that gets us to the beginning of our Q&A time together. We have received, uh, looks like we've received many questions over the past month as people registered for our session. And we received lots of questions during today's session. So let's switch gears and get to our first question today. Well, we have a bunch of questions that have come in. Up first, we have a few questions that are combined here. We can combine them together. These are about um, deleting users who have left and adding a colleague or colleagues as a user and making them an administrator. Also about changing or adding certifying officials. So um, one idea here, Sam, is why not log back into the system um, to show and show and answer some of these, these questions? Sure, Bill. So let me go ahead and transition over. So I'll go ahead and sign in again. And you mentioned about uh, deleting accounts, I think. So we'll go ahead and click on the administrator options link. And again, we'll go to maintain user accounts. And these are all of the accounts within the organization. In order to delete a user account, you can click on the user ID. And then for that particular user, you'll just scroll down to the delete account button. And here is also uh, an answer to your second question in regards to transferring administrator rights. Um, if I wanted to add an, the administrator role to this particular account, I can do so uh, through this on this role section. So you can do that and then you could delete the account if you choose. And then there's and just, a, whole, a whole bunch of other roles there too, as well. That is correct. Yeah. And I believe you mentioned about uh, changing the uh, certifying official. Uh, right. Get back there. Um, so again, that is in the update registration profile. And uh, if you get a system, let's say that you try to delete an account. And let's say that um, the system says that that account is the certifying official and it can't be deleted. Well, what you would want to do is you would want to come to the update registration profile. Then you would want to change the certifying official in this section, go to certifying official, then you click on edit. And then you would want to click on this checkbox that says, I need to change the certifying official information. And you will select the certifying official. So let's say that I was trying to delete this uh, Robert Ramos account. I would maybe want to make uh, the administrator Blue Ocean. And then that would be the certifying official. And then I would be able to go back into the maintain account screen and delete that account. Okay. Back to you, Bill. All right, well, um, we have other questions um, that have come in here. The first one is about um, passwords. Um, and the question is, how? <laughs> good question, how can I navigate around frequently changing passwords, Sam? That's the question. <laughs> I understand. Uh, but NPDB requires that passwords are changed every 55 days. The one-time password feature, using a password received via a text message is available even after the system password expires. Changing passwords every 55 days is particularly critical 
when using credentialing software. What's the next question, Bill? All right, we have a question here about um, whether or not the NPDB provides education verifications. Hmm. Um, so no, the NPDB cannot be used as primary source of information to perform education verifications. An organization must obtain that information from the primary source. Next okay. question, Bill. Yeah, we received a question here about continuous query. I think whether the administrator, whether the administrator username for a physician can be revised for a continuous query. Mm. I think we get this question a lot. I think uh, they're talking about the authorized submitter on the in continuous query enrollment. At this time, the authorized submitter is the individual who initially submitted the continuous query enrollment, and that cannot be changed. Bill, I have some questions for you. Okay. If an organization that includes multiple hospitals has an internal credentialing verification office, can someone from the CVO office serve as data bank administrator? Yeah, I think the answer to that question is yes. Staff employed by that hospital system can serve as the data bank administrator for multiple entities within the same hospital system and within the credentials verification organization. Okay. Uh, question asks, is it possible to register batches of new staff for querying with a single payment? I think this has to do with querying many, um, several individuals with, uh, with under one payment. And the answer is yes. If you, uh, if you need help with this, uh, if, if it's too tricky for you, you can contact our customer service center to walk through the process, but you can um, query several individuals under one payment. Uh, question here says, not all of our providers are getting continuous monitoring. Can this be changed in their profile or do they need to be re-entered? Okay, I think this question seems to be about switching from a one-time query to a continuous query. Um, so if you did a one-time query, it does not automatically convert over to a continuous query. So you'd have to enroll that individual into continuous query. Okay, Sam, some questions for, for you here. Um, this question is about the subject database. What edits can be made on a subject database? Mm. The subject database allows you to store identifying information about a practitioner or organization and use it later to pre-populate query or report forms. You can edit all the query information for a subject, so their name, their school, their license, and that's all editable within the subject database. Okay. Now, this, um, this is uh, back to account administration. Um, how does the role of data bank administrator compare um, with other administration personnel who may be required to submit reports? Mm. I think this question has to do with account roles. Um, the role of the administrator is to create, delete, update profiles, uh, perform administrative functions located on the administrator options page. The report role is needed to submit reports to the MPDB. Same for example, the querying role. So that role must be assigned for the user to submit queries. You can have multiple roles. For example, the administrator, query and report roles all on the same user account. Okay, now uh, next question is, um, yeah, we saw those we saw those roles in the uh, little check boxes on the on the page there. I remember that. Mm -hmm. So um, what are what are NPDB's requirements to serve as an authorized agent? Sam? Um, so in order for an organization to act as an authorized agent, it must be registered with the NPDB. Um, authorized agents also have a data bank ID number even if they are the agent for more than one organization. Okay, um, this question is about, next question is about credentialing. Uh, when I'm using my credentialing system, can users have a different password for the NPDB? Okay, yeah, this, this question seems to be about uh, NPDB account credentials. So for the account that's being used with the credentialing system, 
the NPDB password must be the same password set in that credentialing system. So the NPDB automatically locks accounts when the, when the software and the NPDB passwords are different. So after updating or changing one of their passwords, it's critical to change the other to match. And NPDB passwords, of course, expire every 55 days. I can answer the next question, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Next question says, how many administration, administrations can you have? I think administrators, they probably mean. So how many administrators can you have for your hospital and also for your health system using a CVO? So uh, as we said, I think a couple times in the presentation in, in different ways, we encourage all registered entities to have more, definitely more than one account administrator. So um, a person can serve as the data bank administrator for one for a single hospital, for a health system, or multiple hospitals within a system. For example, having um, having one individual from a hospital, and they could have a second person from its uh, credentials verification organization or CVO, and that's that's definitely allowed. So, let's see what other questions are coming in. Um, we got a question, Sam, about will this training today satisfy the self-guided training required for us to create user accounts that I think we saw online? <laughs> I, I, will, I will say that it will allow you to pass the formal administrative training module with flying colors. So you'll, <laughs> so you'll still need to press the buttons, but you will have the knowledge in order to pass that administrative training. Okay, so we can't get credit for that here. Okay, but you're, you're, it was a good, it was a good, um, it was a good lecture to help us help them study, right? All right. Next question: We have a question here about a credentials verification organization. We are a CVO and we're acting on behalf of the customer. Would this affect sharing queries between departments? Um. So, so we get that that question a lot. It, it really depends. Um, so I would say uh, contact the customer service center. Um, you know, it has to do with with oversight. If there's uh, if if it's shared oversight or separate oversight. So um, once you contact the customer service we can, center, we can kind of look into your specific situation and indicate if it's okay to share or if you must query at every separate hospital. Okay. That's good. So I know there are some particulars with that, whether you can share queries or not. So that's important. Mm -hmm. All right, we got a question about um, identity proofing. When identity proofing a staff member to serve as the certifying official, can an administrator identity proof that individual or is, is it required that they get proofing via a notary? <laughs> So currently, it is required that they are proofed via a notary uh, when you're creating a brand new certifying official. Um, so that is the notary, and then you would need to submit that paperwork to us in order for us to establish that individual as a certifying official. Is it just a, is, is it just for the certifying official? That, Correct, just for the certifying required? official. Okay, mm -hmm. it's because it's so important, and they they're vouching for um, the organization and all that business. Now, what you can do is if you create that person an account uh, and they, they make them an administrator, um, then you would just need to change the certifying official to that person. And then there's no notary involved because they're already proofed. Oh, okay. So that's, that is a, that's a way to do it. So you can add, you can add the role if they're, if they become another um, administrator, account administrator. Correct. You can create an account for them. Um, okay. Because we we encourage more than one uh, data bank administrator anyway, uh, and then once the accounts are created, uh, then you can change the certifying official to them. Uh, they're already proof, so there would be no notary that would be required. Okay, that's that's good advice. That that um, allows you to kind of skip that step, which can be um, um, take a lot of extra time, right? We have a question here, a uh, new opening coming up. A new acute care hospital is opening in uh, mid next year. How early are they able to set up um, an account with the NPDB for that new facility? Um, again, I think uh, for that particular circumstance it's best for, for them to contact the customer service center. Um, it would really, you know, there, we would need to see that there are some registration pieces uh, that we would need to see in place before we're able to approve their account. So, uh, you know, it could be 
for example, the peer review, we would need to, to, to make sure that those pieces are in place. So I would say contact the customer service center and we can certainly look into your specific in, uh, situation. Okay, that's good advice. So please get in contact with us, call our customer service center. We have a question here about authorized agents. We have, we have an authorized agent for three of our entities and they are able to perform initial queries. Why are they not able to renew the enrollments? Oh, that, um, that's a great question. So um, what I would do is I would check to ensure that they manage those enrollments. So the only way to in renew enrollments or is that if the agent manages those enrollments, if the entity manages those enrollments, then the only the entity can enroll can edit and uh, renew those particular enrollments. Okay. So just because you establish that entity agent relationship, we need to make sure that the agent is actually managing those enrollments. Um, so what we would say is um, uh, you can send us a transfer enrollment request uh, and you contact the customer service center. We can walk you through what we need. Uh, but typically, once the entity agent relationship is established, then we would need to transfer the enrollments from the entity, excuse me, the entity to the agent in order for the agent to manage those enrollments. And then the agent will be able to renew the uh, continuous query enrollments going forward. So they can't do that themselves from their screens. They have to get your help. Uh, correct. As far as transferring the enrollments, that's correct. They would have okay. to contact us. But then once the enrollments are transferred, then the uh, agent would be managing those current enrollments and they would be able to renew and edit those enrollments. They as They could add them or delete them. Uh, correct. They would be okay. able to add or delete. Correct. Great. Well, that's a good, that's a good tip. Um, all right. We have a question from a person here. It sounds like a clinician. They just joined a healthcare facility. Uh, or, or no, it, they joined a healthcare facility where the person who's who's gone now <laughs> was the administrator. Um, and so it sounds like scenario four. <laughs> I do not know anything about our account. Should I start a fresh account or can I find our account and edit it? So, so, um, so uh, they can do two things. Number one, they can certainly start a fresh account. Um, if we're able to find the account, uh, then we would do the uh, matching and then we would again transfer the that account to the already existing account. Um, so that's one thing they could do. Or if they want to call us uh, and we can kind of look into their situation, we would ask for their tax ID number. So um, with, with that information, we can look and give them the best course of guidance. But it would sound like either way, they would be going through scenario number four, which would be starting the uh, process from scratch with that particular registration. Okay, okay Sam, and I, I would also ask, um, how does that per, how does that person who's starting out by themselves say, how do they get identity proofed? Um, so that's why they would have to go through the they would go through the notary process. Okay. So and so we would be proof the ident MPDB would be proofing them uh, via the notary document. Okay, because they have no one they could go to, right? That's so, correct. Um, that's correct. Right. So they would have to do the notary. Very good. That's useful. Um, let's see. This question is about the expiring email, I think. When when you create a new user account and it's approved, you have five days to log in. So mm -hmm. is that? Well, you have, uh, no. So when you create um, a new user account, uh, you have five days to complete the user account request. Um, and then once that account request is completed, then the administrator would approve your account. And then once your account is approved, uh, you can log in at any point. Um, but the five days is basically to uh, to complete that account request. If it's not completed within five days, then the administrator would have to delete that account and then recreate another one for you. But they can resend the the email with it. Correct. Right. It, correct. So yeah, within within any, within those five days, they can certainly resend the account request email to the user so that they can click on that link and complete the account request. Okay. Very good. Uh, okay. This is another question about user. Um, the user um, can someone be a user if they are a contracted employee rather than empl an employee hired directly by the organization. Can someone be a user if they are a contracted employee rather than an employee hired directly by the organization? 
Um, I would say to contact the customer service center on that because again, we, you know, um, it would be, they would, should be an employee. Um, so, you know, we would have to look at their specific circumstance in terms of, you know, what they're doing, what type of entity they are in order to determine if they right. should have a user account or maybe they should be an agent. Um, but, you know, typically I would say most of the uh, accounts for that organization should be for employees for that you know particular organization. Okay, so the, I guess the best answer there is uh, it's it's not a yes or a, uh, an easy right. yes or no. So contact our customer service center and, and uh, they'll they can walk you through that. Right. Um, all right. We have a question here about um, is there a problem or concern leaving a user's role as no privileges assigned instead of deleting the account in case they change back to our department? So yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Um, I mean, that's a, a, a certainly a, a, a individual preference, you know, for the administrator. Um, if you want to leave it as uh, no privileges assigned, you certainly can do so. Uh, or if you just want, you know, in case it come back, or if you just want to delete it and re recreate it, uh, you can do so. So that's an individual preference. So you could just uncheck all the privileges and the person's already been um, identity proof. So you have that right. work done, right? Right, right. Okay. Okay. And they won't be, I mean, they won't be able to do anything. Um, so that's, you know, so you're kind of safe as far as the security there. So, right. uh, so you know, it's a kind of individual preference. All right. So you kind of, you can kind of keep them in the bank if you want to, and then um, uh, go from there. All right. We have a question here about, um, do you advise that administrators save the account registration documents for a certain period of time? May we delete archive for employees that ha that leave our employee? Um, so, first question is: Do you advise the administrators save the account registration documents for a certain period of time? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that they don't have to be sent to us, uh, so we can look into that particular question. I think the corollary to that was like: Can they be, uh, you know, archived or deleted if that or if that user leaves the organization, I would say yes to that. Um, they can certainly be, uh, you know, discarded after that if they're if that user is no longer with the organization. Uh, but as far as, you know, kind of the archiving piece of it or saving piece of it, uh, we certainly can get back to you on that. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question about new administrator. Um, perfect for our webinar. I am the new administrator for my company. The ex-administrator is no longer with the company, and I cannot find the NPDB user registration forms signed by the previous administrator for current NPDB users. Do I need to redo them? Uh, no. Um, so if you if you can't find them and you don't need and you uh, you don't need to redo them, no. So I would just say go forward with uh, what you have. And uh, for any new users you create, you would keep the uh, user registration form for those particular users. Excellent. OK. Um, this question is about a credentials verification organization. If you are part of a CVO that credentials for two hospital systems, part of a CVO that credentials for two hospital systems, can you have your own NPDB account or you have to be tied to one of the hospitals? If you are uh, part of a CVO that credentials for two systems, can you have your own account or do you have to be tied to one of the hospitals? So that has to do with whether you're an agent or not, probably, right? That's that's what it sounds like. So, um, you know, certainly, you know, as a CVO, the CVO can be an agent. Um, you know, we have, we have large hospital systems that um, have an agent as a, as a CVO, and then the hospitals uh, that are um, tied to that particular agent. Uh, and and you know, as we mentioned, I mean, you can have an account uh, because you're a part of the hospital system. You can have an, an account with the um, CVO if if uh, one of the hospitals wants to make you a data bank administrator. Um, they can you know you can have an account on on the uh, the hospital side as well. So um, so yeah. So the CVO is kind of a query agent, right, Sam? Correct. Uh, from our experience, that's what they they use it for querying um, uh, the MPDB. So if they're a separate agent, they'd have to register, and then the the hospitals would choose them as an agent. If they're not a separate entity, then they would probably have to be part of the hospital systems, right? Correct. Okay, that makes sense. All right, let's let's see. This question is. Uh, 
Oh, this is a good question. If as the data bank as a da as the data bank administrator, I am a notary, <laughs> can I notarize for the certifying official? Hmm. Um. Uh, yes, I would say yes. You can. Yeah, you can. If you're do a that. certified notary, yeah. right? If you're if you're a certified notary, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think we would uh, have an issue with that. That'd be it's be handy to have a staff member who's a notary around. Okay, let's see if we can get to um, this next question. Uh, can we add an account for our risk manager who is subcontracted with our center? So I know sometimes risk managers have their own reasons, um, like in a hospital system, for um, querying on certain people. Yeah, I mean, if you know, if it makes sense, I mean, I I wouldn't make them the uh, data bank administrator or the certifying official or something like that. But um, you know, if it makes sense, you know, for business reasons, uh, then um, you know, they can have an account. I would say, you know, get in contact the customer service center. We can give you a definitive uh, you know, answer on that. But um, if you know, if it's just a regular account uh, and somebody else is the data bank administrator, that's part of the org is, is data data bank administrator that's part of the organization. Then cer uh, certainly, you know, if it makes business sense. Like I've seen the uh, the example where they um, like for a hospital system, the HR department will have a uh, have a an account. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or the, they'll have a um, an account. The credentialing um, the medical staff office will have an account, and sometimes the risk the risk management department will have an account because they yeah. they would query for different for different reasons on different people, right? So yeah, yeah. I mean, with that, we just we we want you know people with from the organization to be you know certifying official, data bank administrator. Um, you know, it shouldn't be a consultant. You know, type of type of thing. Um, but if you know corollary accounts. You know, for those those particular roles, um, you know, like if it makes business sense, then that's probably okay. Um, certainly, contact the customer service center; and we can give you the definitive. All right. So, um, very good. Let's see. We have. Uh, you, so, I think you're scoring 100 on the quiz so far. So, <laughs> <laughs> what a hot seat, Bill. <laughs> can the can the, I'm trying to help you where I can. Can the certifying official and data bank administrator also be the designated user as well? Yes, absolutely, right? The certifying, if you if they have the role, if you're the uh, certifying official or the administrator, um, you can um, you can query or report and, and have access to billing, right? Depending. Correct. The, yeah. So the certifying official and the data bank administrator can be the same person. So and as acting as the, the data bank administrator, you would have the and you can have multiple roles in your account and query and report and do all the, the functions of the administrator. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if we're with a really small organization, you may be the, the user, the certifying official, the administrator, and the whole thing, right? So um all right, so this is this is a tough, this is kind of a tough question. During a delegated credentialing audit, so it's a, a credentialing audit, what portion of the NPDB report can be viewed by the payer who is delegating the credentialing process to this sounds like a consultant or not? Okay, so that question is a little outside the scope of account administration. Yeah. I do. I I will say um, there is, there, from my knowledge, I think there is something. There might be something in the guidebook about that. I would have to research it. But you know, send that send that to the CSC, and we will give yeah, you. Yeah, if you want to email us that yeah. question or yeah, um, definitive um, response on that, we can we can look at it. That's kind of a policy question about who yeah the, who can read the query yeah um or who can read the report. Sorry about that. Um, all right, let's see. This is a, a query question. If one if one user enrolls a provider, will the other user accounts be able to see the query results for all enrolled providers of the entity? Uh, ask me that question one more time, Bill. All right. So this, yeah, it sounds. I think the answer is yes. So if, um, so on an account, if mm -hmm. one user enrolls a you know a doctor a provider. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess in continuous query, say right. Will mm -hmm. the other user account? Will the other user accounts be able to see the query results if they're assigned the role of querying? I guess they would, right? You could see. Um, yeah, they they should be able to see it. They may not be able to. The only reason why they would not be able to see it is because the administrator has the uh, the um, 
the option or the ability to assign to assign privileges of querying uh, to a particular account, um, and this is in, in kind of an entity agent setup. So, uh, if if there is no agent involved, then yes, they should. Um, but if there is an agent involved, then it just depends on what the administrator assigns that uh, account, like who they can query on behalf of. Well, uh, say there's an account like that, Sam, where you know the, there's an administrator and someone only has the billing privileges, um, and or someone only has reporting privileges and and billing privileges. They can't see the query. Queries right on the account is that right? Right, in, in that particular case, I would not be able to see the the, the queries. But if if the if if uh, all the users have reporting, querying, and billing privileges, they can all see the same information on the mm -hmm. account. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, we're at our. I think we're at our. Yep. Yeah. Um. This is our. This is going to be our last question. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> when I will help if I can. When trying to remove a user who left our facility, it was learned that the person in our the per, that person is our certifying official. Mm -hmm. When trying to remove a user who Correct. left our facility, it was learned that that person is our certifying official. Mm -hmm. a, a prompt comes up advising that person can't be removed. Correct. So that that's the situation that we outlined where uh, you would need to change the certifying official first. So you need to remove them as a certifying official, and then you would be able to delete their account. So if the administrator and the certifying official are the same person, and you try to delete that administrator account, you will not be able to because an entity needs a certifying official. So what you would need to do is go to the update registration profile and change that individual as a certifying official make somebody else the certifying official. What if they want to make themselves? This, this is the case. <laughs> Including they're... themselves, correct. You can make yourself the certifying official if you choose, okay. Okay. and then and then they can go back and delete that account. Okay. That sounds like uh, he or she is an administrator. Right, is a new administrator, correct. I'm not sure yep. how right. to become the certifying official. Okay. Correct, correct. Yep. So, so you do that through the... Um, the, to the update registration profile, you'll find the old certifying official, you'll click on edit, and then you'll be able to click on the checkbox that says make myself the certifying official. Uh, and then you'll just go back to the maintain user account page, click on the user ID, and then delete the account. Excellent. Well, I'm happy to say, Sam, those are all the questions we have for you. I don't think uh, I don't think um, we were able to stump you. Um, so let me just say to everyone that's still with us. It was a close us, call, it was close call. It was close, it was close. <laughs> um, so really uh, on behalf of Sam and, and, and I, we'd like to thank all of you again for spending this time with us today. Uh, be on the lookout for the survey, answers to your questions, NAM certificates, and um, thanks again. Goodbye for now. Thank you.